Every Bible, turn over to Mark chapter 14. If you don't have a Bible, we have a blue one in the back that you can use tonight. Or if you don't have one, you can use that as a, a gift from us. My name is Pastor Dwayne, for those that don't know me yet. Um, so we're going to be in Mark chapter 14. This is the longest chapter in the book. And so there's 72 verses. We're not going to get to them all tonight. Uh, I, won't, I won't keep you here that long. Uh, but if, if I would say this is one of the chapters that, you know, as we move from the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple and Jesus talking about how the leaders should have been bearing fruit, how the disciples should be bearing fruit, and as Christians should be bearing fruit, this is actually one of the stories where we actually get to see the fruit of someone's life. So it's moved from the figurative and the the parables and the teachings to now we actually see it hit the ground uh, running in, in this first opening story of this chapter. So uh, as we turn there, you know, next month I celebrate 20 years of when Jesus found me uh, back east for the first time and I gave my heart to him and I knew him. And so um, it was by age 17 though when this happened and you know, at that age, I really had everything planned out. I was getting ready to graduate high school. I knew what my future was going to be. Um, you know, I, I wasn't really great at sports, but I was good at them. And so that, that bought me a scholarship through football and through wrestling to go to college. And so, you know, I thought I would just go and I would attend a church because my dad was a pastor. So, you know, I wasn't really on fire for God. I said, you know, what, I'll find a little church. We'll, we'll attend on Sundays like we're supposed to. Um, you know, through college, I'd probably get my business degree. And out of the three sons, I would be the first one to graduate college uh, and finish that. And so I was really excited about that. And then my next step would be I wanted to buy a home and a very specific home. I wanted a white house that was two-story and I wanted a wraparound porch. It was very specific. I had all this planned out. I remember this. And so um, I wanted to be in the country. I wanted to marry, you know, an ethnic lady because, you know, I grew up in the back east and in the military. So, you know, I just wanted that adventure and I wanted to have kids. The problem was the plans I had for life did not match up with the story that God had written for my life. And so if you think about this tonight where we are, um, God knows each and every single one of us with great detail and he is the author of the universe. And so being the author, he has a perfect story for each and every one of us laid out that he's already prepared for us. And what I needed at age, to, at age 17 and I still need today is to allow God to customize the story of my life and allow him to write it for me. And you know, I don't know where everybody is tonight, but I know a lot of us are going through transitions. We've had a lot of families that, you know, through the military have moved and, um, you know, all these different things. And it seems like we're in a transition period and we've talked about that and we keep praying about that and it's important that we all need to allow God to end our current story sometimes so that he can write the next chapter in our lives you know it can be scary to think about but it's also very exciting as well isn't it because we know God has something great in store for us. And the only way we can do that, though, is to allow God to write our stories, is to be at the feet of Jesus all the time. And what do I mean by that? This is, when I talk about the feet of Jesus, this is a place where we bow ourselves and worship to God. And we're there continuously. You know, we're worshiping a God who fixed our brokenness. Our problems, our issues, he fixed everything that was broken about us by being broken himself. He was broken on the cross for our behalf. And as a result of that, Jesus brought what was dead in our lives back to life. That's why we're celebrating tonight. That's why we're here. In Mark 14, it's a very action-packed chapter. Um, the focus kind of moves away. So, um, you know, Jesus, Jesus was portrayed as a very fast-paced servant through the book of Mark. It would change from one story to the next, and it was very fast-paced, and it was all about what Jesus was doing. But here in chapter 14, the, the, the focus kind of walks away from Jesus' actions, and we get to look rather on Jesus' friends and his enemies' actions toward them as he heads to the cross. We'll see in this chapter as we get through the next couple of weeks, we'll see Mary anoint him. That's the one we get to start out with first. We'll see Judas betray him. We'll see Peter deny him. And we'll see even the Sanhedrin go ahead and arrest him all in the same chapter. So this is what everybody's doing, their actions in response to Jesus. And as I, Isaiah 53, 7 says, he is brought as a lamb 
to the slaughter. And that's the media behind it. I was thinking is this, is, you know, man is desiring to kill him. We've learned that about the religious leaders. They're done with him. He has upset the apple cart, if you would. He, he has stepped on their toes as leaders. And he's saying, look, there is a God to worship, not man and his religious ways. These are not what's important. It is a relationship with God. And so they desire to kill him. But it is Jesus who will be giving himself over to the hands of men. They would not be able to touch him unless he did this. So Jesus, his friends, and his enemies, as we get through the whole chapter, you'll see they'll all take very different ways, but all ends up at the same place. They have to come to the cross and make a decision there. In John 2, 3, Jesus told his mother at the wedding of Canaan, he said, when the first miracle, when he turned the water into wine, his, his mom was coming to him and saying, look, you have the power to do something about this. And what did he say? Mine hour has not come yet. It isn't time for me to be revealed. Well, in the shadow of the cross, now here in chapter 14, it is his hour. It has come. And if you were there 2,000 years ago, this would be what I would consider holy ground to be on with the disciples. They, they miss it. They don't get it. But it would be holy ground like when Moses was called to deliver the children of Israel at the burning bush and God said, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground but instead of Moses being the deliverer, we have the perfect deliverer who will deliver all of mankind, not just one race. Jesus is that deliverer. So let's pick it up in verse 1 together. It starts out by saying, It was now two days before the Passover and the feast of the unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. So that word stealth there, uh, it can also be a craft in other uh, translations. But at the root meaning of the Greek word is this, they were just trying to trick him. Now put yourself in this situation. They are trying to trick who? God himself. You already know these guys are on a bad start. They're, they're being foolish, but what their hope was is saying, hey, we're not going to arrest him when the Passover feast is going on. Remember, there's almost 2 million people in Jerusalem. This was a big event. Um, so they're, they, they didn't want to do this when everybody was in town celebrating because the common people, we've talked about this over and over again, it's not that they love Jesus. They love Jesus' gifts. They loved that he went around healing them. They loved that he went around feeding them and acknowledging them and loving them. They loved that part of him. So the leaders feared with as much gratitude as the people had for Jesus for being this new style teacher who actually cared about the congregation. They were afraid that if we take him while everybody's here, they'll rise up against us. But God had a different story written out that Jesus would be publicly crucified for all to see. To why? To, to show that we all had equal part in Jesus having to die. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? We're all in that same boat. All of us contributed to the reason Jesus had to go to the cross and die. Now I want you to think about this spiritually. Righteousness, which is Jesus, it's incarnate. Everything that was perfect, pure, and holy, he's passed all the tests in chapter 13 as being the Passover lamb. Righteousness and sin. Every sin that we have committed as a human race from start to finish, sins that haven't even been committed yet, they are both headed to the cross and they're going to the battleground, if you would, of the cross, but only righteousness will walk away victorious at the cross. Now, the Gospel of John goes a little bit more in detail in this story. So I'm going to pull from him throughout as we're reading these verses together. Uh, but, you know, he just starts to describe these next few verses. There's a dinner going on at a, at a household. And it's important that we understand that who's at this dinner as it's going on in these verses. So the Gospel of John, he describes who's at the table. And the first person that we hear about is Lazarus. He's at the dinner table. Do you remember who Lazarus was? He was the one who died. And Jesus wept. Jesus wept so much because he loved him. It moved him. It stirred him at the sound that Lazarus had died. And when he finally got to the tomb, it's the one where he said, Lazarus, come forth. And what happened? 
The power of the resurrection brought Lazarus back to life. And out of Jesus' love for this man, it was, he brought death back to life. So he's there. So think about this. At sitting at the table, you have Jesus who is claiming to be God. He is saying, look, I am the Messiah. I'm the one that you've been waiting for. I'm, I, I, I've come to fulfill all Scripture and the law and everything. I'm right in front of you. He's claiming this. And then you have sitting on the other side, Lazarus, the proof of who Jesus was and the power of the resurrection, the power of God. It was the fruit. You had the claim and the answer all on the same table. But what we also had there in John's Gospel is he talks about we also had Judas, the betrayer, was sitting at the table with them at this dinner. He would be the one that would lead um, the defection against Christ and he would bring the, the crowds against him. At the same table, we have light and darkness. That's a, that's a pretty spiritually, uh, if you could just look into the spiritual realm, what was going on. There had to be battles going on at this table that we, we were not even aware of. And while all this is going on, a simple woman walks into the room. Let's pick it up in verse 3. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at the table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard. So again, we're going to pull from John's Gospel. We know this is Mary. This is, uh, you know, the Mary mother of Jesus. This is Mary, the sister of Lazarus. So she's the sister of the one sitting at the table. Um, you know, Mary had... At that point, she'd already experienced with Jesus and with Lazarus a point of devastation in her life where she lost a loved one. And, you know, probably even she felt like a part of her soul died on that day. But Jesus stepped in with incredible love and restored her brother back to life. If that's not the salvation process, if we truly understand salvation, if we truly understand when we're saying the sinner's prayer, we're not reciting a card, we're not reciting a sentence, we are acknowledging that Jesus has paid the price to bring us from death back to life, and we have it for all of eternity. That's what it is. And so think about this. She's experienced this physically in the restoration of her brother. But we experience it spiritually for all of eternity. Now, Mary's an interesting character. Um, she had one important characteristic in her heart that she always, anytime that you would find her, she was always at the feet of Jesus throughout Scripture. Um, and she would allow Jesus, while she's at the feet of Him, to end one chapter of her life and to write the next chapter. God, how are you going to bring me out of this one? What's next in store for me? She was constantly there. So if you remember, she was also the Mary that was uh, the sister of Martha. And Martha was the one that was in the kitchen that day. And she was serving and she was cooking and she was trying to prepare everything for the disciples. And her sister Mary wasn't helping her. So what does Martha do? Like any other good sister, she gets mad, right? Why are you lazy? Why are you doing this? So she bursts out of the kitchen and she comes out and she, she just says, Hey, where are you at? And where does she find Mary? At the feet of Jesus. And Jesus says to Martha when she comes out, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. And one thing is Him. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. So we find her at the feet of Jesus. When her brother dies, and Jesus gets the word, he's, he's still a distance away from the tomb. He, he hasn't got there to this point yet, but Mary knows he's there, so she runs to him. And the first thing she does is she dives and falls at the feet of the Master. And she says, Jesus, if you had only been here earlier... My brother would still be alive. I know you can heal. And by placing, her at the feet, or by placing herself at the feet of Jesus, it prompted Jesus to move. Jesus is about to complete this chapter of his earthly ministry. It's going to be done. Everything that the disciples got to see and hear and witness that they will be proclaiming in Acts to everyone. Remember when Peter was beaten? We talked about this last week. And he says uh, they were threatening. The, said, the leaders were saying, hey, you can't preach this anymore. Or, or we'll throw you in the jail. We'll beat you. And he says, do whatever you have to do. But for us, we can't stop talking and preaching about what we've seen and heard. It is too much for us to keep in. 
So Jesus is about to complete this chapter and what he's going to write is the gospel in these next couple of chapters. What was done, the message of the gospel will go out and complete the ministry of redemption, the call to all saying, look, there is forgiveness of sins through Jesus, the only way, the only truth and life. So let's pick it up again in verse 3. We'll end this one, uh, or end this verse together. It says, A woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. Now, in Jesus' day, to secure money, one of the traditions was you would go out and you'd buy very expensive perfume or ointment, and what you would do is you would hide it, whether it be in your house, but most of the time uh, it would be in kind of a clay pot, so they'd like to go out and actually bury it in the yard. And that would be like a, a modern-day savings account. And so it was believed, though, that this one flask of perfume would have been worth one year's wages. Think about how costly this is. This is a lot of money for her to be doing this with. For Mary, this perfume actually may have been her dowry. It could have been given to her so that she could use it to obtain a husband one day. It's very valuable to a young lady. It'd be a family heirloom. And clearly, like I did at age 17, she has a plan. She had her future planned out. If, if there's a rainy day, I've got this I can fall back onto. If I need a husband, this is where it's going to go to. All of these things. She had her future planned out. And then she does the unthinkable. She breaks her future and places it on the head of Jesus. Everything that she had, she gave to him. She poured it over him in worship of a Savior who again had brought life and light out of the darkness and death that she had seen. It was too much for her to behold and not do something about it. I've, I know he keeps saying he's going to the cross. I can just hear in her mind, what am I going to do? What's the last thing I can do for someone who brought my brother back to me? And she probably doesn't understand yet what the cross is for. Not only is he going to bring Lazarus back to life, but man, he's going to restore many, many sons back to the kingdom. A theologian by the name of Lane says this, Early in the first century, an elder remarked that the best ointment is preserved in alabaster. The value of the perfume and its identification as nard suggests that it was a family heirloom that was passed on from generation to another, from mother to daughter. You know, that begs a question. Will we give our future to Jesus? Will we allow Him to write that story like Mary's doing? I'm going I'm to give it all to you, Lord. Now, it was customary also in Jesus' day that when a guest would come to dinner, you know, it's desert. Think about this. It's hot. It's sweaty. There's sand everywhere. It's dusty. It's not a pleasant place to be like the Northwest where we get the sun blocked out all the time. But what you would do is when a guest would come in, you would put a drop of oil on their head and you would anoint them. Uh, it wasn't so much spiritually uh, a, a, of significance, but it was of ceremonial significance that you were giving them honor. And it would kind of be like uh, today if, I, if you came in from a hot, sweaty day... Uh, and you just had dust all over you, and I had prepared for you at dinner a nice, warm, you know, like cloth that was already wet and ready to go. And then you could wipe up your face and your hands, and you could, you know, get the refreshment of that, get the sweat off of the day. But this one action of Mary showed her understanding of the time at hand that the disciples were still missing, that Jesus was more than just a guest. The king of all kings had actually rode into Jerusalem two chapters ago, and if anyone should be anointed, it should should be him. And why save any drops for anyone else? It's all his. Give him all your praise and his honor is due him. And I like this, that she did this without a word. She just walked in. It must have been very interesting to be sitting at dinner and Jesus is just sitting there. Think, put yourself in that scenario. Jesus is sitting there, he's relaxed, and all of a sudden somebody just comes in and they break open the vial and they just pour it all over his head must have been a beautiful sight, but she did it without a word. And it tells us something about her. You know, Martha was a talker. She was the one who would come out and complain and, you know, say, why aren't things getting done? And, you know, that was her style. But Mary was the doer. She got things done. James 1.22 says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Mary had seen and heard what Jesus had done, and she could not do anything else but respond to it. 
Now, she gave up her plans for the future, her security and her family heirloom, herself, her husband, all these things to allow Jesus to write the story because she knew that everything that she had accumulated, if Jesus wasn't in it, it wasn't going to be a good future. And this was an extravagant act of giving everything to her Savior. Now, she, I like this because she didn't look at the disciples and say, Hey, did you agree with this? Was this a good thing to do? She wasn't worried about their opinion or if they consented about it. Um, she didn't even look to her brother who had been raised from the dead. Did I do the right thing to honor the God of the universe who brought you back to life? She didn't even look at Simon the leper and say, The owner of the home, was this okay to do? You know, as our master, which is Jesus in our life, we should only be worried about what Jesus thinks about what we're doing. Not our brothers and sisters in Christ. Not any other man or woman should we be worried about. We should only be worried about pleasing Him. We are called to stand for and on Jesus alone and invest ourselves into Him. Let's pick it up in verse 4 together. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, Why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they scolded her. So again, in John's gospel, we know the person who was angry. It wasn't just a group of individuals. The main one who was doing it was Judas, the betrayer. And what he tries to do is he tries to use this excuse of, hey, this shouldn't have been given to Jesus. This should have been given directly to the poor. Well, it was to hide the fact that he was a thief. He was a treasurer for the disciples. And he was known to be a thief. And you know, if she had given the money to him to give to the poor, most likely it would never have went to the poor. It would have been used selfishly uh, by Judas, uh, whatever he wanted to do with it. So it's interesting here, though, the word wasted that Judas used to describe the action of what she did. This was wasted on Jesus. Man, the audacity of someone to say that about the Messiah, but he did. It is the same root word that we get this word from, that we also get the word perdition. And Jesus would call Judas the son of perdition. And, you know, as I was thinking about this, the way that Judas is described by Jesus is, it means, man, there was a life wasted. Here is a life wasted. That's how Judas was described. By God, I gave him life. I gave him breath. With the same breath in his lungs, in the same mind that I gave him, he blasphemed and betrayed me. It's a wasted life. In the group, though, they did scold her. It can be easy to want to defend yourselves. You know, when our actions are for Jesus, when they get mocked or questioned, we want to, we want to you know, bring defense up against us. Well, this is, this is why I did it. But remember what Paul said in Romans 12, 19. He says, Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scripture says, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. And what does Jesus do here? She didn't say a word. She didn't have to defend herself. But Jesus rebukes the group. Now who's going to be hanging around Jesus? The disciples, right? So they were, they were in on this. And they get rebuked by Jesus again. So let's pick up in verse 6. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. So Jesus counts her waste as Judas and the guys and other men would describe our efforts to give to Jesus. Hey, that's just a waste is what man would call it. But what did Jesus call it? A good work. This was beautiful to me. This is exactly what I wanted. And it was his disciples who, uh, who thought this because they were still getting it wrong. Remember, he's had to come in and tell them time and time again what the purpose of him being in Jerusalem is for. And he's telling them, this was for my burial. She understands. This woman who everyone else dismissed, she knew that Jesus was about to die. She may not look at the whole picture. She may have understood a little bit that she was, he was dying for her. But all she wanted was to give everything to him in worship. If you're going to die, if this is the last moment I get with you, Lord, and I know our relationship is it, so much, put yourself in her shoes. I want to show you that you meant everything to me. 
And she did that here. Now Jesus also teaches a very important concept that we, we always will have poverty with us. There will always be the poor until he returns for us one day. Now, this is important to understand because no political or economic movement will ever fix world poverty. Okay? If the mission statement is right off the bat, we're going to end world poverty, they're going to be working against Scripture. It's not going to work really well. Now, don't get me wrong. I like helping the poor. It's why I work at the mission. That's why I help the, the individuals. But, you know, thinking that it's going to come through politics and economic change is not going to change anything because poverty is not uh, a result of government's flaws. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt that they have flaws, but that's not the real issue. The root of poverty is sin. It's a sinful world that we live in, and it's a twofold heart condition. And you know, this is actually a very small, minute amount, but we do have some that have the sin of laziness. You know, they have no purpose in life, and they will not work. But that's only a small reason that we have poverty. Probably the biggest one that I can find in Scripture, and if you look around you, you will see it today. The bigger one is those, those individuals who do work hard, and what they do is they, out of selfish gain, will take from the others who also work hard, and then they will do it so they gain all this wealth and then what do they do? It's at the expense of others. And so there's no distribution of it evenly. So what, what happens? Why do we have that? It's because sin. We're selfish individuals if we operate in sin. Jesus says what? Love God and love one another. If an employer actually loved his employees as he loved himself, would he be making more money than them? No, they would be taken care of their families would be taken care of. They would have everything they need. It's a heart condition that we have to feel like we have to save up and earn enough for our future. But really, what is it a result of? We don't trust God with our future. And that's why people act like that. But the early church had the fix. You remember in Acts chapter 2? Their hearts were changed because the Holy Spirit had come in and transformed them from who they were to who they are now, followers of Jesus and His teaching. And so in Acts chapter 2, what they do? They sold everything they had. And they gave it to the poor, to the needy. They worked hard together to make sure that no one did without. Now, if the world flipped its gears and did that, everybody would be taken care of, right? It would just automatically happen. But, you know, those that couldn't physically work, they would take care of them. If there was those, if there were widows, if there were orphans, everybody was taken care of. So Jesus is teaching us, let us know, a political movement or economic reform, that's what Judas wanted, that's what the disciples thought, that's what, you know, the, the religious leaders thought, that the Messiah would be this one who would come and take Rome out and restore his kingdom. And that's not what he was there to do. He will, but his kingdom is in the hearts of man, not in government or politics or the economy. So, you know, we can't end it, but with a heart transformation where we start looking out for others, that when we love others or we teach others to love the way that Jesus taught, a heart's transformation won't end poverty in this lifetime. But man, it's a great start. It's a great start to show what? The love of Jesus to others. You know what? Maybe I don't need to make this much. Maybe I can spread this out to my employees. Maybe I can spread this out to my neighbors. All these things, it comes from knowing and following after Jesus to love others that way. Verse 8 goes on to say, She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. He says this beautiful statement, she has done what she could. Do you realize that's all God asks of us? is for us to do what we can to bring glory to His name. Whether it's cooking a meal for somebody who needs it, whether it's you know, mowing somebody's grass, or uh, it could be that simple, it could be bigger. But you know, we, sometimes we get intimidated. How I need to do this big thing for God, or I got to get enough money together before I can serve God and, and give. No, He doesn't want that. He wants what we have right now, whether it's big or whether it's small, to do what? Bring glory to His name. So He asked or tells, She did all that she could. So that would be our question tonight. What can we do with what we have right now to bring glory to His name? God took the simple act that she laid at Jesus' feet and through the Holy Spirit. Think about what's happened. God has, for the last two millennium, has proclaimed the gospel through this act to believers and to unbelievers. 
That's a great story. And all she did had some perfume. How many of you have perfume in your closet right now? Everybody has some at the house? It's a cheap thing now. It wasn't then. But that's all she had. And, she put, and he's used it to proclaim the gospel. A gospel that states that Jesus has called us from death to life for forgiveness of sins. And we can trust him with everything. That's what she was proclaiming. Everything I have, everything I'm going to be, I want to put it at Jesus' feet. Because when we put our lives in the loving hands of Jesus and we allow him to write that story for us, then we find true life. That's why when the, the, the apostles and these guys, they write their letters now, what do they say? I'm a servant. I'm a bond servant to Christ. It's not a slave out of, you know, um, you know, out of a master, the tyrant. They're saying, look, I am so chained to Jesus because of what he's done for me. There is no way I can leave his work. There is no way I can leave his side. I want to be here. And that's why, you know, I would love to see those Romans' faces when they were chained to Paul when he was in prison. And he just said, all right, I've got eight hours with you. We're going to talk about the gospel. Every single person. He said, I'm free from the blood of every man I've ever come in contact with because they knew the gospel when I was done with them. That's a life that has been changed by Jesus. David Guzik writes this about this part of the scripture. It says, in the Kidron Valley of Jerusalem, laying between the Mount of Olives and the Temple Mount, there is a spectacular tomb carved out of the solid rock. They call it Absalom's tomb, but they know it came from around the time of Jesus, not the time of David and his son Absalom. So they know Absalom is not buried there, but no one knows who it is. A very wealthy man thought to make a lasting memorial to himself, and he is forgotten to time and history. This woman, with her simple and profound act of loving devotion, made an eternal memorial. That's what Sherry was quoting from the book of Revelation, that we are written in His hands. His name is on our forehead. Those are powerful hands to have our names in for all of eternity. Nothing can pull them from Him, like Romans says. Verse 10 together says, Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him, or betray him to them. And then, when he, they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he saw an opportunity to betray him. So it appears that Jesus' high praise of this simple act of Mary was Judas's final straw. You know, he had been planning this. The, the bitterness in his heart was already there. Um, but I want to say this was, this was it. This is what prompted him. I'm done with this. This isn't the Messiah that I wanted. This isn't the God that I constructed in my mind. This is not him. But it was. It was Jesus. Now, it's important to understand Jesus did not prompt Judas to sin. He never leads us in the temptation. So we have to be careful how we describe the sovereignty of God. There are some that will say, you know, God makes it happen. No, God doesn't enforce sin. But what he did is God did use a willing Satan and a very willing Judas to do what? He allowed them to betray Jesus so that story of public crucifixion could get done. They were willing to be part of it, and God allowed it to happen. Now, remember, the leaders, they did not want this to happen during the feast. They didn't want to happen during the festival when everybody was here, but God had a different plan. So, you know, they had been wanting to destroy Jesus for so long. We've seen that chapter after chapter after chapter, or at least ruin his reputation time and time again. And imagine now they have the precious ally that they've been wanting. One of Jesus' very own disciples has turned on him. Someone who's walked with him for the last couple of years. Someone who's heard every teaching, has been there for every miracle, everything that has went on, and he betrays him. And we know it was simply out of greed that Judas betrayed him. That's why poverty won't end. Because we still have those who run off greed. Matthew Gospel tells us that Judas asked the leaders, what will you give me if I betray him? And what did he get? 30 little pieces of silver. Wasn't much. It is selfishness that robs us from being the main character in God's story. Like Mary here. God exalts the humble, but he resists the proud. He wars against them. Now, tonight, as we wrap this up, I would like to challenge you practically to be like Mary. To practice worshiping at the feet of Jesus. How do we do that? There's a very simple way that you can start out. 
I would challenge you guys to take 15 minutes in the morning, whether you're waiting for your coffee to brew, you know, your, your tea to steep, or if you're in the shower, I want you to do two things. I want you to write them down. I want you guys to reflect on your life and take evaluation before you go to the work day, before your kids wake up, before you see the next person in your life, I want you to reflect on those things and ask yourself, who am I living for today? Who am I doing this work for today? Am I, are you, dedicated to God as we claim to be? That's a good way to start your day out. Is at the feet of Jesus asking that question, what am I even breathing for today? Once you reflect and evaluate, then pray on those results. The Holy Spirit will bring it to your understanding what we need to do or what we're doing well. Colossians 3.23 says, Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Because if we're not, who are we working for? Ourselves. That's not the heart transformation that Jesus has been preaching day in and day out throughout Mark. And it's high time we do what? Start worshiping God. Start worshiping Him. Stop worrying about what man thinks of us. That's a hard thing to do. I haven't got there yet. There are times I'm like, is this the time I should share the gospel? Is this the time I should stand up? The answer should be yes every single time. But I still struggle with that. We serve a God who brings and has brought dead things in our life back to life again, like Mary. And we should be bursting into households with the same love and adoration and worship for Him as she did without any concern, a daily worship at His feet as if no one else was around. Amen? Amen. All right, would you join me? For communion, I want to reflect tonight and just have communion together. And what I want to reflect on is that Jesus was that perfect sacrifice. That same message that stirred Mary to worship Him, that deadness in her life was brought to life because of what Jesus had done. Not because of what she'd done. She didn't earn it. She didn't do anything. She just fell at His feet and said, Lord, move in my life. And He did. So the verse tonight is Luke 22, 19-20. This is Jesus Himself. It says, And Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So we have the elements up here. They're in two cups. The cup on the bottom has the bread. And the cup on top has the, the juice. And so, just take, when you're ready, come up during worship. And I just want you to reflect on that. And allow that to just seep into our hearts. And whatever is still not an area that we worship God fully in, there's no condemnation in that. If there is, you just shower yourself with grace at this point. But you say, God, because of grace, I don't want to stay the same way I've been this entire time. Help me to allow you to write that next chapter in my life. Would you pray with me?